So tonight I hope to provide some thoughts on how the current Puerto Rican crisis reached this point and what solutions will best serve the survival and progress of the Puerto Rican masses. To do so, I will touch briefly on the following themes. The unprecedented nature of the current debt crisis. Could Puerto Rico become America's Greece? How is the crisis directly affecting the Puerto Rican people? Why 117 years of colonialism is central to understanding the crisis? Why Puerto Rico is a corporate gold mine, not a welfare case? How did the island's debt mushroom out of control? Who are the creditors and who are the debtors? How should any proposed solutions be evaluated? Why sustainable energy is key to Puerto Rico's future and the role of Puerto Ricans in the United States? Most attention so far has centered on the total debt the central government, its various public corporations and municipal governments owe to Wall Street and bondholders. That debt has nearly doubled in the past 10 years from about $40 billion to $72 or $73 billion. In a letter that Standard & Poor's issued to Puerto Rico on September 10th, the rating agency lowered the island's credit rating to CC, one of the worst ratings possible, even lower than that of Greek bonds. Standard & Poor's noted in its letter that the Puerto Rican government now owes bondholders $13,474 for every man, woman, and child on the island, equivalent to nearly 50% of annual gross domestic product. But that doesn't begin to explain the dimensions of the problem. On top of the bond debt, Puerto Rico owes another $30 billion to its main government employees' pension fund in unfunded liabilities. As Bloomberg News reported on September 25th, the Commonwealth's Employees Retirement System, which covers 119,000 employees as of June 2014, had just 0.7% of the assets needed to pay all the benefits that had been promised, a level unheard of among the US states. That's Bloomberg. He's saying that. 0.7%, less than 1% of the money promised to future retirees is available by, for the Puerto Rican government. In 2008, a previous governor, Sila Calderon, the Sila Calderon administration, issued $2.9 billion in debt just to meet its current pension payments. They were called pension bonds. The sale was underwritten by the Swiss bank UBS, produced big conflict-laden fees for UBS, whose representatives have since been found guilty of fraud and are immersed in scores of lawsuits from bondholders who were cheated. Calderon's successor, Governor Luis Fortuño, ended up subsequently ending all defined benefit pensions for new employees in Puerto Rico. But the cash infusion the pension funds realize from that borrowing will run out in five years, at which point the government will have to come up with another $2 billion annually to pay for pensions and for the additional debt that it took out to tide it over for these, uh, these current five years, and will likely have to slash benefits to retirees even more. The pension bonds, those, that $2.9 billion in pension bonds, are so worthless, they are now selling for about 30 cents on the dollar for anybody who dares to buy them, right? Meanwhile, the teacher's retirement system, that's a separate retirement system, the public school teacher's retirement system, is only about 15% funded. The court's uh, employee system is only about 14% funded. That represents about another $10 billion that the government owes in unfunded liabilities to those uh, the only, only the pension system of the university professors is in better shape, but in a messy bankruptcy battle that is sure to come, who knows what kind of pension cuts a court might impose on all the retirement systems as part of an overall settlement with the universe of debtors. Then there is the healthcare funding crisis. In June, the 
federal agency in charge of Medicare and Medicaid announced that on January 1, it will slash by 11% its payments to 250,000 enrollees in the island's Medicare Advantage program. Uh, despite plans by the federal government to increase Medicare reimbursements to the 50 states by 3%, it's cutting its allotment to Puerto Rico by 11%. The cuts will mean a loss of $300 million a year to Puerto Rico's local government and healthcare system, a system that is already suffering because it's been capped for decades now at only 70% of whatever the federal government gives per capita to other states. The combined impact of the enormous bondholder debt, the massive unfunded pension liabilities, declining federal reimbursements for health care represent a perfect storm that Puerto Rico, with its shrinking economy and depression-level unemployment, cannot possibly withstand without some kind of radical restructuring of its debts in the short term and of its economy in the long term. That is why some of us have described Puerto Rico as America's Greece. Could the island's economic collapse and debt crisis threaten the larger economy of which it is an integral part? Most financial experts you read about dismiss the notion. But then most discounted the possibility that the subprime mortgage crisis would spark a worldwide recession. The, skepti the skeptics this time include some prominent liberals such as Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, who raised the outlandish idea a few months ago that Puerto Rico was simply a victim of geography. Writing in the New York Times, Krugman said, quote, Puerto Rico may to an important extent just suffer from being a slightly hard to reach island in a time when corporations place a high premium on easy just in time shipments. In many ways, Puerto Rico is worse off than Greece because it has even less ability to act independently than that depression-wracked nation. The normal refrain you hear in most media accounts is that Puerto Rico cannot resort to the normal protections of, of federal Chapter 9 bankruptcy because federal law only permits cities or public corporations within states to use Chapter 9. And since the island is not an independent country, it can't go to the International Monetary Fund to seek some kind of a financial bailout uh, the IMS is infamous for concocting. The island is in this atypical netherworld, they say. But very few go one step further and ask, why is that? If it is neither a state nor an independent nation, what exactly is Puerto Rico? And why is such an important issue like what happens when a government can't pay its debts falling through the cracks when it comes to Puerto Rico? The answer is colonialism. The answer is Congress can make any laws it wants when it comes to Puerto Rico, and in the case of bankruptcy, it did just that. First, you have to understand, though, how this whole issue of municipal bankruptcy came about. During the Great Depression, cities in America started being unable to pay their debts. So in 1938, Congress passed uh, legislation that created Chapter 9 bankruptcy. What that basically says is that you have a whole bunch of people that you owe money to, and you can't pay them, and they all come demanding, well, I, I have the collateral of this building or, or that revenue stream, and they all want their money. You have to have an orderly restructuring. And you need a nonpartisan person, a judge, to decide how much each of the debtors will get. <laughs> what will be the, the, the reorganization plan? And so this was passed by Congress in 1938 to assist cities that were set by the, uh, by, uh, the impact of the Great Depression. But from 1938, when the law was passed, until 1978, Congress had included all the territories and possessions of the United States under that law, which means Puerto Rico had uh, bankruptcy protection from 1938 to 1978. But then between 78 and the early 80s, there were other changes to the bankruptcy law. In 1984, there was an amendment inserted into the bankruptcy law by Senator Strom Thurmond the infamous Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, and Bob Dole, 
who were both in the Senate at the time, they put it, they stuck in a little notice provision that specifically said chapter 9 did not apply to Puerto Rico. No reason was given. No federal policy or interest in the change was spelled out in the amendment process. By a few simple phrases in an amendment that few people noticed, Congress laid the basis for the unique situation Puerto Rico now faces. It is not only broke, there is no established legal recourse for it to get a court to decide how the many debtors will get paid or how much. So absent any kind of, uh, of such protection, there is going to be years of litigation by different bondholders and the government's going to have to spend millions of dollars in legal fees trying to figure it all out. Uh, and there's no, there's no roadmap for how that will happen. Much of this came to light when Puerto Rico tried in 2013 to create its own bankruptcy law, recognizing that it had this problem. Uh, a group of hedge funds and mutual fund managers, specifically Blue Mountain Capital, Franklin Templeton, and Oppenheimer, sued in U.S. District Court, claiming that the federal law preempted Puerto Rico from doing that. The federal government overturned the, Puerto, the federal court, the district court overturned the Puerto Rico law earlier this year. And in July, the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston, which is the Court of Appeals for Puerto Rico, upheld the nullification of the Puerto Rico law. But even one of the judges on the appeals panel, who said, yes, that's the law, it's, Puerto Rico is prohibited from doing this, wrote a stinging opinion outlining how unfair and unjust the federal law is that prohibits Puerto Rico from using Chapter 9. That judge was Juan Torruella who is one of the most knowledgeable jurists in the nation on the history of Puerto Rico's status, status. More than 20 years ago, Toruela published one of the definitive works on the question. It's titled The Supreme Court in Puerto Rico, The Doctrine of Separate and Unequal. I recommend it highly if you haven't read it. Well, this is what Judge Toruela said in July about the case before him. The majority's disregard for the arbitrary and unreasonable nature of the legislation enacted in the 1984 amendments showcases again this court's approval of a relationship under which Puerto Rico lacks any national representation in both houses of Congress and is wanting of electoral rights for the offices of president and vice president. This is clearly a colonial relationship, one which violates the Constitution. So you have a federal appeals court judge who's the most knowledgeable person saying, hey, this whole bankruptcy issue is another example of colonialism at work. Now Senator Chuck Schumer, Representative Velasquez, and other friends of Puerto Rico are trying to get Congress to allow Puerto Rico to do what it had been able to do from 1938 to 1978, have the same right as any state to use the bankruptcy laws for its municipalities. But Congress doesn't give a damn about Puerto Rico. So Schumer is trying to do the same thing Strom Thurmond and Bob Dole did back in 1984. He's trying to stick the provision inside some bigger bill that has to be passed, hoping that it will get through. But the reason we're going through this ridiculous exercise in the first place is that Congress has always decided the major decisions that affect Puerto Rico without the voice or the vote of the Puerto Rican people. And that is the essence of colonial domination. This time, though, it's not just Washington that is facing scrutiny about its Puerto Rico policies. Wall Street is feeling the heat even more. And while the big financial experts keep assuring us that there's no systemic threat uh, of a messy Puerto Rico bankruptcy, we should not be so quick to believe them. 